Welcome to day three of the fifth international meeting on internet and audiology. Uh, let me stop sharing our slide, our file. Uh, okay, so today uh, we have uh, a, um, sorry, I'm just trying to, trying to work out with technology a little bit. So today, uh, our topic is um, online audiologic rehabilitation. And this is uh, something that has been around for a while, uh, maybe uh, two decades, and is familiar to many of you, but uh, it has also remained somewhat on the background. And uh, people who work in this area know of the benefits that it may bring, but at the same time, um, it has not made it to the mainstream. So today uh, we will have a, a keynote presentation and then followed by a discussion of why that may be the case, that, um, that people are not taking advantage of online audiologic rehabilitation. And uh, what I mean by that is basically all online computerized means of uh, getting more out of hearing instruments that patients are using or uh, having some sort of online interventions that can help uh, people with hearing loss uh, or audiology patients with their conditions. So this is um, our general theme. And then in the second part of today, we'll have a uh, hearing aid industry panel that will uh, also talk about uh, what, how, hearing aid industries addressing the needs that arose during the last year and what is ahead there. So without one other thing I would like to mention is that for online audiologic rehabilitation, we've had a number of excellent submissions. And if you go to uh, our website, internetaudiology.com, uh, you can review the submissions. We had 11 submissions just in this area. And you can see many of the authors submitted their pre-recorded um, presentations. Uh, during the keynote and the panel today, please put your questions in the chat uh, so we can ask the panelists and our keynote speaker, who I will introduce shortly. Um, and remember that you can use the layout button to get the best view depending on how many, many people are present in the meeting. Uh, following the panels, we hope to see you in Gather Town. Say hello and continue the discussion. So at this point, I would like to go ahead and introduce our keynote speaker, uh, Dr. Gerhard Anderson. And I should mention that this meeting exists today in many ways, thanks to Dr. Henderson, who was the chair of the first and the co-chair of the second meeting on internet and audiology. Maybe later, Dr. Anderson can provide us some perspectives on how the meeting has evolved. Dr. Anderson is the professor of clinical psychology in Linköping University. He is a world-renowned expert in the area of internet-based psychological treatments including hearing loss and tinnitus. Working with many colleagues around the world, Dr. Anderson has authored or co-authored more than 600 papers. And in recognition of his influential research, he has been the recipient of the Swedish Psychologist Award, the Nordic Medal Medical Prize, and a Lifetime Achievement Award from the International Society for Research on Internet Interventions. So we are pleased to have Dr. Anderson join us today to share his research and ideas on online audiologic rehabilitation. Dr. Anderson, um, you should be able to share your screen now. Is this working? Yes. Okay, that's great. Uh, thank you for uh, this opportunity to uh, talk to you. 
and I will do my best to share my experiences in this field. And as mentioned, we started this small interest group meeting many years ago now, it seems, and I'm so happy to see that it's grown and there is still interest and uh, in perhaps even increased interest in, in the field of using modern information technology in audiology. Uh, as mentioned, I'm a psychologist and professor in psychology, but I also spent some time in the clinic as a clinical psychologist, seeing patients with mainly tinnitus, hyperacusis, and sometimes hearing loss and dizziness. I usually mention that because I think it's an important thing as a researcher if you can combine with some clinical work. Yeah, whoa, it man I managed to go to the next slide. That's a great achievement. Disclosure, uh, <clears throat> I don't earn so much money out of this. I usually beg for money to do research from research funding bodies, but I have indeed published four tinnitus self-help books. It, they don't make me rich in any way, but it's a conflict of interest. And as the material on which these books are based is the material we use more or less in our uh, internet interventions um, research studies. And the aims for this talk, uh, uh, I will tell you about our experiences with tinnitus using the internet. I will mention hearing loss and dizziness, but indeed there is much or there is less work on hearing loss using online rehabilitation and much less work on, on dizziness to the best of my knowledge. And I hope that will change in the future. And I hope some of you guys who listen here today perhaps might be inspired and don't hesitate to contact me if you want any advice or any anything, you know, because I think this is really important and I think it's a question of reaching our patients and in particular those who don't have access to rehabilitation, uh, which are many people across the world. Just briefly, I know this is an internet and audiology meeting. Some of you might know quite a lot about this, it's evident, but perhaps some are not. And I think uh, much of this work is based on a psychological treatment uh, format uh, called cognitive behavior therapy. You all recognize that. It's a psychological treatment, it tends to be structured with homework or things you practice. And it's based on changing the way you think about your problems and they actually change your behavior. It's usually described as a collaboration between the patient and the therapist. But there's a range of techniques, administration format, and target problems. The important thing with CBT is that it has been shown to be fairly more than possible to transfer to different formats. So you can do CBT in groups and you can do it by reading a book and getting some help with that. And you can also do it in a self-help program over the internet. So that's the whole idea. So this is old knowledge. Uh, we're not reinventing the wheel here. Briefly then, and you most of you are already familiar with this. What is internet treatment? There are various forms of this, and it's become more confusing now actually with the COVID because it's very common to practice video therapy or video consultations. Um, there is much less research on video consultations. To the best of my knowledge, no controlled research on video consultations for tinnitus, for example. Uh, but I know many clinicians practice that, and some have done so for quite a while, and some have increasingly done so now, uh, so now when it's possible, when you don't need to see your client or you cannot see your client because of uh, uh, th this uh, COVID situation. Anyway, but the internet treatments, the way we usually do it in our studies is we can use text, it's very text-based, but also films and sort of graphics and pictures. It resembles very much online education. I, very often stress that because it's not sort of rocket science, very advanced app or interactive. So it can be fairly simple as long as it works. Most of the studies and implementations for tinnitus and other conditions have been in the form of guidance from a clinician. The guidance is very minor. It could be just sending back when you get your homework 
sent uh, when you send your homework, you get feedback from the clinician saying, "Good work, keep up the good work, good luck with the next chapter or module or whatever we call it or lesson." Here is an example of a trial we did in a Kurdish language called Sorani, just to illustrate the fact that with the best of intentions, I can see patients in Swedish when I see them face to face, but I, I don't know this language. But with internet interventions, you can fairly easily transfer and culturally adapt an intervention and reach groups who you would not be able to reach otherwise. And, and it needs to be said that working with a translator in psychological treatments like CBT is a bit tedious and problematic and I know some of you might recognize this. In the best of worlds you are bilingual lingual, so you know many languages but there's a limit to that. Right so this is an advantage. Here are some slide shots from uh, uh, Eldre and Vinay who I will mention, uh, close co-workers in the United States and this is the Tackling Tinnitus program. Just to give you a hunch how this might look, it's obviously you could consider doing it more flashy and more commercial looking, but to the best of our experiences, patients or participants, what they really appreciate is that it works. It doesn't crash, so you log in. And by the way, at least in my country, security is an issue. So of course, these are encrypted uh, uh, solutions where you need to log in with an extra password from your phone and also the system is responsive which means that if you log in through your computer it looks like this whereas if you do it through your phone it looks like a, a web app or is a web app yeah without any extra effort from you the history now uh, once i thought i was young and promising gradually i'm realizing i'm getting older and uh, whatever that means it's good in a sense it's good but it also means there were ages ago now i cannot even say that this was 20 years ago we started with this for tinnitus it's actually 22 years ago so it's extremely yeah, very long time and um, i was lucky to work in the audiology clinic in Uppsala, my former university and uh, one of the executives there the boss of the whole ear nose throat plastic surgery building he had an interest in telemedicine so he was willing to sponsor an implementation of this so i usually boast and say that this is probably one of the if not the first one of the first at least regular services using the internet for rehabilitation in any any area and in particular with tinnitus and it's still running so it's been running since the sort of late 1990s as a regular clinical service where patients can get internet-based treatments uh, in the hospital yeah but back then technology was very primitive and uh, not so beautiful you see a screenshot here how it looked like but uh, i'm very happy that we managed to get a sustainable solution and has to do with payments and stuff like that as well you know there was uh, enough number of people who were interested to get this uh, uh, um, through the internet and we did the first trial and this is again you know 20 years back we didn't know exactly how to do this trial so people dropped out quite substantially now they do so less but you know it, if there are differences between different settings and cultures and i know when we've run studies now in the us uh, dropouts in some communities have been a bit higher than we used to hear in Europe but that's just a question of time I assume when you get more used to it so this was the first trial and then uh, we published a self-help book uh, based on this material and this is an interesting thing because most self-help books in audiology and in general are written by clever people, but not so much backed up by research. So you first you publish the book, eventually you do some research on it, but this is the other way around. So we did studies and then we discovered that this will not reach people who don't have access to the internet, remember 20 years back. And so we published a self-help book and tested that as well. So this is the first one. 
more or less the same material updated, modernized in a way, but uh, sort of similar. Along the lines um, over the years, we had to do, and I will I won't bore you with all the studies we've done here. And I will go mention a few examples and then refer to a systematic review done by by Eldre, uh, and, uh, and just to get a hunch of how well this works. So this is one of the typical study from the early days when people rightfully asked us, well, this, this sounds promising, but how does it compare against seeing your patients in a group treatment? So we did this kind, this is a small study, but still uh, it appears to hold for other conditions as well. So guided internet-based treatments for tinnitus resemble the, get the effects that you see in face-to-face -face treatments and group treatments, which is, uh, by that time, was very promising for us, I think. Not everything is a success, and I think it's, I take some pride as a researcher, not only telling you about the success stories, there are also some failures, and this needs to get out there, you know. Not a strict failure, but they, we had a collaboration with researchers in Australia, where they translate, we translated the program, made a shorter version into English, and then it was presented through the company website of British Petroleum, BP. It didn't work out so well. It wasn't really strictly randomized. It was a cluster randomized trial, and the uh, adherence was poorer than usual. Perhaps, you know, it's, it's worth thinking about, you know, the setting where an intervention is presented, and, uh, but at the very least, it was one of the early tries as well, worth mentioning. We moved on here and uh, uh, here in Sweden, and this is an example of a trial where we, we became very interested in a different way of doing cognitive behavior therapy, more, more focused on acceptance, psychological acceptance, Perhaps I need to clarify what that means. It's not, you know, accepting that you have tinnitus and not caring about it. It's more like being able to live a good life, even if you still have your tinnitus, you know. And that's, we noted that historically, because when we asked patients in our previous trials, they sometimes mentioned that spontaneously, you know. I was very helped by the program. I think I can accept my tinnitus now more. But it's not like sort of telling people you need to accept this, you know. Anyway, so it's called acceptance and commitment therapy. And what we did then was to compare this form of internet treatment against our older version than the CBT. And as you see here, if you get a sort of understanding of the graph here, doesn't seem to be much difference between the two. If anything, the old thing seems to be a slightly better than at low time follow up. So Nowadays, we tend to mix a bit about this, but I need to stress that as a researcher and a clinical researcher, I'm never satisfied. You know, there's always room for improvement and things we can do better, things we can discover and investigate to see what's needed, what can be skipped and so forth. And that's uh, continuous work. Oops, now I did something wrong here. I pressed the wrong button. And I, you seem to be nice people, even if I don't see you. So I hope you forgive me. I pressed the button end, which is a very stupid thing to do as a presenter. Uh, yeah. I don't speak German. Most of you perhaps don't either, but this is the German version. I had uh, the fortune to have a postdoc coming over from Germany, spending two years here with me in Sweden. And since she didn't know Swedish, we decided let's do the research in Germany. So this is what we did. Uh, and, uh, and this is the German version of it. So we translated the program into German and uh, uh, conducted a few studies there. So this is a typical graph of uh, this again, published in Saxomatic Medicine. And for those of you who are not researchers, not so used to this, uh, we have something called standardized mean difference or effect size and that's the thing that's called hedges g here and if you have an hedges g of 0.88 that's a large effect and you this is T thi scores so they went from 50 down to 30 that's that's a decent effect 
uh, I would argue, from a, a, a real um, a treatment that aims to reduce the tinnitus distress. Not pressing the wrong button now. And as with, uh, here comes another self-help book uh, for the same reason, you know, in Germany, they have 80 million people or something like that, loads of people and loads of people with tinnitus. So when we do studies in Germany, it's a question of hours before we have enough participants for a trial. But again, most people don't get access to this. So we decided to, or my colleagues here decided to do a, a book version of the treatment as well. So that's uh, uh, available as well. Okay, over now to the more, more recent collaboration. It's a very good collaboration I have with um, uh, Eldre and Vinaya here. Um, Vinaya and I worked a bit together in his thesis here in Sweden, uh, which was more focused on hearing loss. But then he approached me and said, why not do some collaboration on tinnitus? And I thought it was a very good idea. And I've just Googled before this presentation, I discovered that there's a separate flag for Texas. I think, I hope I'm not stepping on any toes now doing something wrong. So I thought, let's add that type because he's, he's in Beaumont, Texas. And I visited there before the COVID. It was a really nice place and I would love to go back anyway. In the UK, we started with started to do pilot trials and RCTs. Uh, the program was um, a bit more translated and updated and a bit modernized the way in it, the core principles are the same as when we started. So one to get a hunch, what is this? This is a typical setup of the intervention. Uh, um, much relaxation, actually, progressive and applied relaxation some focus on cognitive techniques like reinterpretation of tinnitus it's cbt cognitive behavior therapy so there is a section on your thoughts that you might have about your tinnitus and we'll have to work with those for some exposure if you're very afraid of your sound you might need to practice that a bit but then there are also these are for all people there are also optional modules and um, this is actually one of the first examples in the world of tailored internet interventions. So this is dating back to the my one of my first PhD students in this field, Victor Caldo, who came up with the idea to tailor the internet treatment when he uh, adapted it. So we know uh, for that a significant proportion have so insomnia problems, but not all of them. So it would make no sense for every tinnitus patient have insomnia. Same goes with co concentration problems, noise sensitivity and hearing loss, hearing tactics. So these are optional modules or elements in the treatment. Right, so here's a slide shot of how the tackling tinnitus again, just to illustrate that nowadays since broadband access, we can actually um, um, use video as well to illustrate uh, the treatment. Right, here's one example of Elder's Child. I won't show you all of them, but this is uh, in Earring Hearing um, a few years back, um, compare um, against no treatment control, some reductions. And again, this is the last self help book to the best of my knowledge, um, based on the event. Finally, we have it available in English now. If you want to get it's very transparent because if you wonder what's in that treatment, you can see it's there in the book. Right, over to systematic review. <clears throat> we published this not too long ago, so I don't think there's so many new studies. There are a few more, but I don't think it would change. Again, referring to effect sizes here, against every control, it was a moderate effect size. Against inactive control, getting nothing. It's a bit more and active controls, that means some kind of alternative treatment or tension. The effect size is, is lower, but still uh, uh, still statistically significant, 0.35. Promising. And these are based on 12 studies. This is, I also work with depression where there are hundreds of, you know, so many studies. Tinnitus, there are not, there are not enough of us who do this. I would love to see more researchers getting 
into this and have it replicated like we have in we work with social anxiety there are six different places or seven who have replicated uh, the findings that in different places in the world i would love to see that uh, within it as well and here's the typical meta-analysis uh, flow chart of how it might look like uh, differences between studies yes over to hearing loss that's what tinnitus we've done a few things on audiological rehabilitation this is not strictly cbt it's um, more educational program on hearing loss and this was one phd student in uh, linköping here i actually lived in in the south of sweden and worked in denmark but anyway so uh, uh, promising and then we've done one study on remember i talked about acceptance oriented treatments that can be relevant for hearing loss as well you don't get cured uh, uh, so uh, we did this with people who had psychological problems and hearing loss and these are the effects in that study just to give you a teaser of the work elder has been summarizing together with us here uh, the effects of that as well the effects are perhaps a bit smaller um, but also promising you know uh, effect sizes much fewer studies here's only five and so there's more work to be done here when it comes to research and here's the uh, graph presenting the different effect sizes right and finally dizziness i will just conclude by saying that there is much less done and it's Lucy Jardley and her group and I've, uh, uh, who've done uh, uh, some work on vestibular rehab over the internet. And she did some self-help work before that as well. So it's more or less that being transferred into the internet. But given that dizziness is such a common problem, and it's at least in my country, it's not treated that often. Even if there are physiotherapists to do it, they tend, most of them are focused more on pain. So it's uh, very often ignored in G GP settings. So I would really like to see more work done on dizziness. Okay. Slo slowly moving on and soon ending. Uh, there are many different studies. That's a good thing, including qualitative studies. I didn't mention that, but I would mention a quote by the end. This has the potential to reach many people all across the world because we can translate programs and that would be a dream study to uh, if you could reach people all across the world within a study. The results are promising and um, perhaps you could be a bit negative and say, well, the effects are not as large as for panic disorder and, you know, these other things I work with. But if I were compare against the the results we see with chronic pain. Tinnitus is actually, uh, the results for tinnitus is actually quite good, you know. And so I, it's, that means that we really, really should focus on trying to reach people with tinnitus, uh, uh, the ones we cannot uh, see in the clinic, and uh, as a complement to our other services, I think so. But it's been very slow to be implemented, and I think that's something that we will discuss later on today. And another possible disadvantage is that it has been mostly been text-based, which means that people are not so able to read, will not be reached, you know. So that's something we need to consider. And as always in research, they tend to be a bit more educated people, or at least in, open to be participant in a research study. Not everyone is open to that, you know. And uh, so that's something I'm well aware of as a possibility. There is a qualitative study that you might be interested to have a look at later on to see their experiences. And here is a, an example of a quote, actually. I find that when I see those, I do like the numbers and the figures and the effect sizes. I'm a researcher. But I don't trust only that. I'd like to see some patient comments as well. So in this case, it was quite promising. My emo now my emotional reaction is different. It took away a lot of the fear and stress associated with tinnitus. I'm not afraid of it as I used to be. I don't feel I don't feel it's so scary anymore. I'm not frightened of it. You know, if you can achieve that, that's quite good. Of course, everyone is not as happy as that, but it's still very promising, I think. 
And by that, I'd like to end and see if there are any questions. And stop sharing, I think. Yes. And that's how I do that. Thank right. you. Uh, yep. Thank you, Dr. Anderson, for a great talk. Um, we do have a couple of questions uh, from Jill Preminger. Um, one question is, what steps do we take in order to culturally adapt the CBT tinnitus program? Um, yeah, thanks a lot for that question. You know, I don't have so much experience uh, of cultural adaption for the tinnitus treatment. That's the work done by uh, uh, Elder and Vinaya for the Spanish adaption, and they work quite hard with that and to adapt it for the Spanish population in the US. And obviously there was a cultural adaption done by Eldre and, and, and for the UK version and by Cornelia for the German version. But there are some procedures in this and my advice actually is to work with the locals. So when we do um, adapt interventions into Arabic language, we do in other research, it's preferable to have people who come from that culture and not the least because of the language and the nuances. So that's a strong advice. You know, it's very hard to adapt something from an outsider's perspective. So work with your, have a, a, a local as co-worker or co-researcher or participant re, in other ways. Uh, uh, th that's my, my own experience and advice. Yeah. Thank you. Um question from Andika de Visser. Uh, do you think there is room for this CBT-based uh, tinnitus therapy in a regular clinic setting uh, as a hearing healthcare profession? Yeah, I do think so, you know, because, you know, uh, all the, and I think we, the work with Elder, who's an audiologist, shows that this, the guidance, most of the guidance is not psychotherapy. It's guidance in relation to the program. And it's pretty straightforward. And what you could do it, you could, uh, if you're a bit uncomfortable, you know, I'm not a CBT therapist, you could have supervision and some training. And I really would love to be able to do that. So you can do, use some of these methods because the material is, speaks on its own sort of. And since it's asynchronous support, you don't chat with the person. You can, if you get a question and you're a bit uncertain, you can get second opinion or supervision uh, uh, in relation to that. So I think uh, if the if this has been, that's my opinion at least, if this is restricted only to trained psychotherapists, this will never see the light and never be spread because they are not interested in tinnitus. So we need to share techniques and methods. And for tinnitus patients, I think also they need to see that we understand tinnitus in audiology. You know, it, this is not a psychological problem per se. It's a multidisciplinary biopsychosocial problem. Like, so you need all the disciplines, including physicians, by the way. So, yeah, long answer. Yep. Thank you. Um, another question from Claire. Bernstein, um, wonderful presentation, Gerhard. I completely agree. Uh, can you discuss types of interventions used for the active control groups? Various, you know, sometimes it's just attention, sometimes it's group based. And in one of Elder's trial, it was treatment as usual in different NHS, National Health Service settings, or the audio clinics. So it varies. But Mind you, in terms of this is the researcher speaking, treatment as usual varies between countries. Like in some countries, services are very good. In some countries, treatment as usual means nothing because you don't get any treatment for tinnitus. So it needs to be, uh, um, and that's a problem in research when you s combine different research studies, it's not really so easy to see what was the treatment as usual here or what was the control condition. Yeah. So, but I'm, I'm against many other research. I, I, I don't think waiting list groups are, is a wrong 
first you need to know, is this better than getting nothing, which is very common in tinnitus. Then you need to compare against like attention or sort of counts, non-supportive counseling or whatever to see the specificity of it. Yeah. Thank you. And question from Bree Coral. Is there anyone with tinnitus you would not recommend uh, a program like this? Yeah, of course, you know, as I work as a clinician myself, uh, I can imagine many people, you know, you need to be sort of psychologically minded. That's one thing you need to have some kind of skills, self management skills. You need to be able to use a computer. You need to be able to read. Uh, but uh, those people who are suitable for Internet treatments tend to be the same people who are suitable for counseling and therapy in general. So it's not that there are clear differences, you know, and uh, and if anything, in other research, I work with blended treatments. So it's easy to think, oh, will we get unemployed now? Will they take over? No. Patients sometimes and clinicians very often prefer that you can have some role and you see, you can see the, instead of seeing the patient like 10 times, you see the patient four times, but you support the patients with the self-help program. And that's a service model for the future, I think, because instead of seeing two patients, you can see four or five or six, uh, having the, yeah, reach more people. Okay. Thanks, and uh, perhaps last question before we go to our panel. Uh, Jill Preminger is asking, um, how successful you have been in keeping these programs available for use after research studies are complete? Uh, could you give some examples on the delivery system to individuals with tinnitus and or hearing, dizziness and hearing loss? Yeah, yeah, no, but my overall, and I've been developing numerous programs together with students and PhDs for a range of problems. And most of them don't see the light because I tend to view myself as sort of not inventor, you know, I'm, I'm more interested in running the, the, the first study on uh, loneliness, treating loneliness. Other people will, can implement it. But with tinnitus, we've actually been quite successful, you know, because it has been provided for more than 20 years as part of the NHS in Sweden, National Health Service. And now in my own clinic here in, in Linköping, we've just started. But it's a slow process. And I know other like private dispensers and the private sector, <clears throat> and that's been a bit harder, but it has to do with the legal system and what you can do and not. But I'm sure this will. Uh, happen in the future i sort of froze here uh, do you hear me yeah we can hear you your video um did freeze uh maybe if you start stop and start it um yeah okay i was a little uh, bit stiff there i noted and i didn't recognize myself very stiff yeah anyway. okay yeah not the usual gerhardt we know no no uh, <laughs> Okay, well, um, maybe that was the signal that we should bring our panelists and we're right on time. Thank you to all who sent the questions. And Thank you. Uh, we will continue now with the panel and uh, you can continue to submit your questions through the chat uh, so we can ask the panelists. Uh, let me... Uh, as the panelists are joining us, uh, let me introduce our panelists. Uh, one second. So we have, uh, in addition to Dr. Anderson, uh, we have Dr. Chanji Fu. Uh, Dr. Fu is the professor in the Department of Head and Neck Surgery at UCLA. His background is in biomedical engineering. He has spent many years doing research in cochlear implants, optimizing implant processing, and most notably for our meeting, has been the driving force behind Angel Sound, which is a suite of software applications that has been popular among cochlear implant patients and cochlear implant audiologists. 
um, so he can share his experiences. Uh, Dr. Nancy Ty Murray, who is a professor in the Department of, of Otolaryngology at Washington University School of Medicine. Uh, Dr. Ty Murray is the former president of the Academy of Rehabilitative Audiology. And Dr. Ty Murray has done research in many areas of audiology. Uh, audiology. Uh, she is a co-founder of CLEAR, which is another well-known online software for audiologic rehabilitation. And uh, finally, Dr. Ellen Henshaw is a senior research fellow at University of Nottingham uh, with a background in cognitive psychology. She has had a very productive line of research in digital interventions and specifically in effects of hearing, uh, interactions of hearing and cognition. Uh, she has published well-cited influential, influential studies and reviews in this area. And we are very uh, pleased to have all the panelists here. Uh, of course, we could go on with everybody's achievements and then we'll probably spend the whole panel just listing them all. So we'll, uh, in the interest of time, just go straight to the point. And if we could go around and if each of you uh, could say what you think is the most significant development in the area of online audiologic rehabilitation has been or what the future holds in about three minutes, that would be wonderful. Um, maybe Dr. Uh, Murray? Sure. Hello, everybody. It's a pleasure to be here. Um, at, I am the um, CEO of CLEAR. We have just launched a new product called Amptify, and this is what I see the future of oral rehab being, and that is digital therapeutics. And Amptify is the first hearing healthcare digital therapeutic. You'll, they've already been introduced in other areas such as diabetes management and weight control. So what is a digital therapeutic? It is a software often coupled with hardware, such as a hearing aid, or in the case of uh, diabetes, an insulator, insulin injector. Our therapeutic has four key components. One is an interactive curriculum that's accessed online. And every day our members uh, log in and have interactive quizzes, uh, informational sessions, education. Each week is a different topic, such as uh, engineering the environment for maximum listening. Uh, one week it concerns speech reading and includes speech reading uh, tips and tests. Another week is about nutritional ways to manage hearing loss, etc. All the things you wish you had time to do in your clinic, but uh, uh, time that lets you provide that kind of follow up. Uh, so. Uh, interactive curriculum, the second key component is gamified auditory training. And so I emphasize the word gamified because in my opinion, if auditory training is not gamified, it's not engaging. If it's not engaging, you're not releasing dopamine into the brain and you're not potentiate, potentiating uh, perceptual learning. So we have a lot of games that are, have been developed by a professional game designer and a graphic artist. Uh, the third key component is online hearing health coaches. And so you can't just tell somebody, go do auditory training and expect them to do it. They need coaching, supervision, encouragement. Um, the hearing health care professional also uh, supplements the curriculum and answers questions. And they're trained within our Amplified uh, program. So we certified all, all of our hearing health coaches before they're allowed to coach our members. And the third key component component of a digital hearing health care therapeutic is a social chat room. So uh, hearing loss, uh, unfortunately, can be a very lonely experience and isolating experience. And so we group our members into social chat rooms, making it uh, both homogenous and heterogeneous groups so they can interact on some things, add on others. And this group is led by one of our Amplify hearing health coaches. Uh, we have scripts they follow. Sometimes it corresponds to the, the curriculum. Sometimes it's other topics. But the idea is to stimulate ch chats within these groups. So they share solutions, uh, 
triumphs, frustrations, and kind of uh, decrease the loneliness effect. I think digital therapeutics are the way of the future. You know, so many audiologists provide diagnostics, treatment in the form of hearing aids, but the cost and time preclude oral rehab. And so what we're doing is trying to give a means to outsource the rehab after the hearing aid fitting to experts uh, on an online platform. So you're able to, to reach and touch your patients in a way you wouldn't have been otherwise. And so that's, that's what I see the future of being uh, digital hearing healthcare therapeutics. Thanks very much, um, Dr. Fu. Oh yeah, uh, as, uh, Nancy, uh, what Nancy is uh, really great. I think that's really the direction we should go. But I have a slight different view, uh, view for other things. Uh, first, I think a lot of things, even we have the uh, talk about online, a lot of things is very really different, depends on the the, 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 the things, the preventatives. A lot of things still text based, but for the auditory, a lot of speech based. That is a very different modality, how we tackle that one. And uh, the, with the uh, advance of computer technology, actually, is online specifically for the speech, it's uh, become a very powerful and all. And really, the digitalized become a really a uh, uh, value related we can utilize. For example, actually, sometimes computer based can provide a feature really can for traditional person to person really cannot do. For example, the uh, computer based, we can do so many things. We can include so many materials like environment sound, like uh, the speech on speech, speech in different kinds of noise. Sometimes those kinds of traditional auditory rehabilitation cannot do because when you go to face to face, you only need to talk to one person, but for a computer, you can provide the whole platform, really the, the, the spectrum for all kinds of stimuli you can provide it. And also you can provide like a different speaker and different rate, and also sometimes you can really can process in real time to mimic the in, uh, real environment. And, but uh, from that point, it is so important, but from another point, with the internet, we really have, we don't know how many people embrace it. We still need to figure out the situation, both internet online base and the person in person have different advantage and disadvantage. And from my point of view, really these two methods, we need to think about how to combine those two methods, make bad, maximize the uh, uh, really such as rehabilitation outcomes. And uh, also another point of view is, we have so many different uh, applications, so many different methods, really. So, and also the issue is a lot of literature, we should a lot of mixed uh, findings about the auditory rehabilitation, um, either online or a lot of things. One, my point of view is really lack, because for, for example, very similar to the glasses. If you give the one method or one class to everyone for hearing, for glasses for like the eyes that are impaired, that performance, some people is good, some people don't good at all. Same thing for auto rehabilitation. E, you provide one application to everyone. Sometimes really a lot of people is, uh, some people didn't fit that program. I do think rehabilitation is similar for the future of training of our medicine called precision medicine. That means we really need to find a, a way how to provide patient for the Prevision rehabilitation. That means specifically for individual patient. How can we provide either such as internet, especially for internet, because as internet uh, uh, online is so flexible? How can we provide individualized rehabilitation? We call that uh, such as uh, for those people, individual people. And also with the new technology, especially about AI. AR and VR. AR for augmented reactivity, VR is a, a virtual reality. This one actually is very powerful. And in the future, I do think with the new technology, we do able to provide the, the environment really will be for the future rehabilitation. I do think please so. Because when you use all the technology, you can really uh, provide environment for the, the patient needed. If then combined with precision rehabilitation, I think that's the direction we should go for it. That's it. Thank you, Dr. Fu. Uh, Dr. Henshaw. Hi. Um, so, a, a lot of 
my research is focused on adults with age related hearing loss. So I guess that's where I'll, I'll kind of ground my thoughts for where things might be going in the future. Um, so what we have the, the benefit of with online audiological rehabilitation is the ability to extend all the good stuff that we can do in clinic um, on a, a much grander scale. Um, and not only to extend reach to people who might find it difficult to come into clinic uh, regularly or, or simply because we don't have the clinical availability to see patients as regularly as we would like to. What we can also do is extend the pathway to preclinical um, online audiological rehabilitation. So looking at people um, before they know they've got a, a hearing loss, uh, reaching out to prime help seeking before um, um, at an earlier stage, hopefully, to get people into the system way before they're, they're currently um, uh, attending. To kind of bolster and support the, the service that we provide in clinic by offering ability to self-manage um, and to take an active role in their rehabilitation, which is, is really important for motivation um, and to help with the maintenance of treatment options. So to really kind of support the patient in, in a wraparound care perspective. Um, so I think that's quite, quite important. Um, I do have slightly different views to, to what we've heard already in terms of how prescriptive that needs to be. Um, I don't think one size fits all. Um, online interventions will work for some people. They won't work for others. They'll work at different intensities for different people. Um, we have to we have to personalise them. We have to make sure that what we offer is aligned to patient need. I think one of the main things that we were really interested in in Nottingham is is what we have available in terms of the tools that we can pull upon in terms of people's health behaviours. So we know that if people are going to um, engage with rehabilitation, they need the knowledge, they need the skills, they need the access to healthcare, um, they need also the, the motivation to engage with healthcare. So if we can provide all of those things, um, either within clinic or, or online, um, if we can provide all of those things as a package, it's much more likely that people will seek help, that they'll engage with treatment options, um, and that they'll maintain that help throughout the pathway. Um, and hopefully, if we can get them in early enough, this will have really long-term benefits. Um, I think the other thing is about taking ownership of your own health conditions. So um, providing things online, it kind of puts the ball back in the patient's uh, park. They they feel like they are taking an active role. They are owning their healthcare choices, um, especially with things like auditory training. We found that people will really feel that they're trying to do something for themselves instead of being a recipient of treatment. They're an active participant, um, and that really seems to help. Um, I think that's probably most of the things that I wanted to cover. Um, but I'm really looking forward to the panel discussion and to seeing what what questions come up. All right, thank you. Um, thank you for that. Um, so, one idea as I was uh, thinking of putting together the session and <clears throat> looking at some studies done in the past, um, online audiologic rehabilitation or computerized audiologic rehabilitation really is not a new concept and it has been around for a while. Um, but um, for some reason, it never became part of what audiologists, hearing professionals do in the sort of routine way. Uh, and I wonder what are the reasons for that and what needs to be changed? Obviously, this group does not need to be convinced of possible benefits of um, computerized or online rehabilitation. But uh, why is it that we are not quite where we would like to be with it? Um, I'll take a shot, take a shot at that one because uh, I've I've lived that story. Um, I uh, auditory training online has been around for a while, and the two uh, roadblocks I think I've seen with it is number one. Uh, historically, it's been very rote and drill like, and so it's not fun, and so people you know it's tedious to do. 
And so what we have gone in the direction of, I mentioned gamification, the goal is to have these games so fun, you'd want to play them even if they weren't good for you. And I think that's critical. It's, it just has to be engaging or people won't do it. And number two, the other thing I pointed out is uh, you can't ask an older adult to you know, sit in the loneliness of their room and play and play and play. They need to know somebody is paying attention. Someone cares that they log on. Someone uh, compliments them for their progress. Uh, someone in interprets the feedback charts for them, telling them how they're doing. And um, I, I love this idea of being proactive and taking ownership of your hearing loss. I think that's critical that um, that having hearing loss, you should be rewarded for what you can hear and what you can do and not uh, be disappointed by what you can't do. So uh, another key component to developing auditory training is to uh, integrate into the experience a feeling of success. So, you know, they always are, are progressing and feeling like they're doing better. So those, are, I think, are three keys. You know, one is the entertainment value, two is support and encouragement, and three is the uh, little shot of adrenaline you get when you experience success for what you can hear as opposed to fail failure for what you cannot hear. I think those are the keys. And I'd be happy to, to come in um, and just add to that. I think that was really good, Nancy. And um, I think one of the the reasons why auditory training probably hasn't taken off um, and, and hasn't really been adopted uh, into routine audiological care is just because we don't necessarily have the robust evidence. Um, so you'll probably be aware of the, the review that we did back in 2013 that looked at 13 auditory training studies uh, and just showed that there was um, there was a, a hint of an effect there. So we think that auditory training can be beneficial in uh, improving speech perception and improving cognition and improving people's motivation to, to self-manage. Um, but the problem is a lot of the studies weren't robust um, they weren't high quality randomized control trials. So it's difficult to, to provide the evidence. Um, luckily, um, we, we made some recommendations in that review that obviously more high re high quality research was done. And luckily, um, we are currently updating that review and there's an over 200% increase in the number of studies published. So it's been a real, real boost in, in the field um, in recent years, so since 2013. And really importantly, lots of those are RCTs. So we have the, the evidence is starting to trickle through. So we are lucky enough to be able to do a meta-analysis on the um, data that are coming through at the moment. Um, so uh, I, I actually get to look at those data next week. So I'm very excited. I don't have anything to share with you today, um, but do look out for that. And, and hopefully if we can start to show some robust results uh, pulled across different studies across different groups, um, different training stimuli, different paradigms, then hopefully we, we can kind of make a step change in the field and move towards something that can be uh, uh, rolled out more, uh, more generally uh, and adopted into clinical care. Can uh, I comment on that? Yeah, yeah yes, briefly. Uh, I, I think you have a point here because research is also marketing. And when it comes to hearing loss, there are other people marketing stuff, so it's so it's in it's in some for some patients that's uh, that's an important thing, you know, what what you are what you're exposed to and what you hear from your friends and so forth. I've done some studies on online hearing screening, and we discovered that many people experience hearing loss that it's not confirmed if you do audiological testing. There's a huge group of people who experience communication problems, and we don't never reach them. We turn to Nancy's important points. I agree with everything, but there is um, ne not necessarily gamification. This the, the, the evidence is not that strong that gam gamification improves, depending on what kind of problems you have. Like for instance, tinnitus. If you have real problems, you really want to. You don't want to play a game necessarily. If oh, you're I less motivated, uh, just that. less motivated, like prevention. I really think it makes a point, and uh, with all I. I do think you're on the right track, but not by necessity, because I've been living with this for 20 years, people being, you know, persuasive technology, 
but there are yeah. procedures are really important as well what you expect and not only the question of gamification that's my point when it comes to that all right hi dr Fu. a little bit more uh, i think it's specifically about the, the question is why online such applications did not take off i think it's a simple uh, issue here one is how many patients do they think they need the uh, rehabilitation second is how many audiologists think the patient need it third is how many patients really know what kind of resource because a lot of people actually don't know anything so what tool they can available same yeah. thing for the audiology in my example actually because i have the uh, uh, software that can give the uh, cock implant patient for free in the UCL, we have 11, uh, I think like 15 audiologists. And only one audiologist think this kind of uh, resource is useful. So she recommended for all the, the cock implantation, such as for all the uh, visits. But none of others really, they probably don't know at all. So about the why not many people use it, there's many issues here. We really need to address the fundamental underlying mechanism. Why they did uh, they did not take off? Not why not, uh, many people don't use it? Because some people think this didn't help, or they just did not know the benefit about the training. So we need education about the why the training help, and also we also need to uh, 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 tell the audience more about resource and the need for patient, all kind of stuff. Then we will see the whole thing will take off. Otherwise. Without this address, those issues really can solve the problem. But a lot of people think they don't need it, or they just don't know where to find it. I think that's more like the fundamental and the land the issue here is why this cannot take it not take off. All right. And uh, Dr. Tai Murray, I think you had a um, comment oh, you wanted to make. Just a couple comments. One problem with uh, the research on auditory training is we tend to group apples and oranges together. So mm -hmm. under the rubric of auditory training, we can uh, do nonsense syllable drills. We can do connected speech. Some even include piano and musical and environmental sounds. And so that's why it's hard. Uh, I compliment Helen uh, why it's hard to do meta-analyses because uh, you're, you're grouping things that aren't necessarily the same. Um, and the other thing I'd add, I, I wasn't suggesting that tinnitus interventions be gamified. I, I'm talking about the rote uh, listening training experience. And, and the last thing I'll add is I think um, oral rehab is more than auditory training. And I, I hate it when we come down and say it's auditory training because it's that counseling and the support and the information. And that's where I think this idea of interactive <laughs> curriculums that are online, be it for tinnitus or be it for um, uh, managing your environment or managing communication breakdowns. I think there's a real potential for us to exploit that and complement the services that patients receive in house at in the brick and mortar uh, facilities from my just. Yeah, so it, it, it sounds a bit like an idea of a three legged stool. And so you have to actually have all the legs there for the stool to stand. Otherwise, it I will that not be possible to sit on it. So, yeah. Um, so we have some questions from the audience. Uh, and one question is uh, interesting. Do you think that offering online rehabilitation and help uh, will open the doors for inexperienced fake experts and scam artists to also start their own online businesses? And scam people. Uh, so I, you know, I, I, I think that the issue in my mind comes a little bit also in terms of if you look for apps now, there is tons that comes up. You know, I had relatives ask me, well, do you think this is real or this is just a scam? Like they have some sort of a GIF or uh, some interaction. And some of them look very interesting, but of course, unless you're an auditory scientist, you know that this is nothing. And it doesn't really give you accurate data. So I think that the bigger question and that question is also, what do we do about the abundance of technologies and apps with no research, but that are just attention grabbing? And how do we actually stir people to the stuff that works? Uh, 
Um, I'll come in there if, if that's okay. I think um, it's a really valuable point you're making and it actually came to my mind while um, Kanchi was talking that we really need to, to base clinical practice in evidence. Um, so it needs to be evidence based. Um, and I think uh, to, to really maximize um, the benefit of online audiological rehabilitation, whatever the field it might be, whatever domain you might be thinking about, um, we need the the triangulation between uh, education, so for training programs for clinicians, um, through patients, so what do patients actually want, desire, need, um, and through research to make sure that whatever is developed that is aligned to both of those uh, needs it is based in, in real evidence. So um, we need to make sure that it not only works, but it's fit for purpose as well. All right. uh, Dr. Anderson. The problem is that sometimes people don't care about the evidence. And, and if you take the example of tinnitus, cognitive behavior therapy has much more evidence than most other stuff. People just don't care. It is, it's a minor chance in the US and across the world to get that. And everyone knows, but they don't care because they're not being paid for it, not trained for it. So, so it's a huge problem. But the goal should be to at least not at least prevent those stupid things that f fool people, basically. It's not ethically correct. In tinnitus, there's so much crap uh, in the tinnitus field that it's amazing almost to the extent that you start wonder whether people really, perhaps they want to have this hope that there might be a cure tomorrow. So I'm a bit hesitant to, to sort of downplay everything when it comes to bringing hope, but also, you know, fooling people is not correct, you know, it's, uh, uh, so I really so, think we should, yeah. the, the community should be really uh, um, clear about this, you know, there's a lot of crap out there. and. Most of the apps, for example, have no evidence whatsoever. And I uh, think that's a really, a really interesting global perspective because I, I'm um, from the the relative safety of the UK, where many things are governed and and we have guidelines. Um, and obviously, this this isn't the case everywhere. Um, so I think there are other countries that are very much more open to this. Yeah, uh, so in order to be called a digital hearing therapeutic, you have to have evidence based data to back it up. So that's one thing to look out for. What we've done is we're really targeting the audiologist instead of the patient per se. And the audiologist, I think, should act as a gatekeeper for these online programs. So, you know, they should be advising their patients. All right, this is, you know, I always I love the analogy of the orthopedic surgeon giving a knee replacement and then outsourcing to a physical therapist the rehab. And that's how I see the audiologist after the dispensing of a hearing aid say, here are the online programs that will provide the kind of therapy that I would think would be appropriate for you. So the audiologist can serve as a gatekeeper um, in, in the ideal world. I know that that's an ideal conceptual because there are a lot of people who, who go online and just look for the miracle cure as in tinnitus. And so it sounds like we can just have the best evidence and hope that people will automatically start paying attention. We actually have to do extra work and uh, um, educate potential consumers on what to what evidence is good evidence. Um, Dr. Fu, would you like to comment or should we, we can also go on yeah. to the next yeah, question. I actually really agree with Dr. Anderson that a lot of people really don't care what the evidence it is. I do think is relied on the audiology to provide the science guide because really patients don't know idea. For example, one, two products, one have very good, uh, have no use, but have very good marketing. They can see much better than a product with very useful, but no marketing. Really, such as the whole thing is really a lot of people is not maybe some care about the such as the outcomes or such as the evidence, but they have no idea what to do. And we with very good marketing, you can still really can still the patient will use it, but maybe they not benefit. I do think it really such a lot of things is all you need to provide that guidance to the such as the patient and what could be used for. Otherwise, really. Sometimes, really, in the 
hosting, we have so many applications, tons of them. It's hard, even for us, sometimes it's pick which one's good or which one's bad. And uh, the patient really, they rely on this because they have much less knowledge and much more difficult for them to really to pick from out one out of 100. Really difficult choice. I do think uh, we really need to think about how to address this one. Otherwise, really, no idea. I have hundred uh, applications. What? You, you only can use one or two. Really, you cannot use all of them. It's tough for us uh, to just question. So. Yeah. Okay. Um, thank you for that answer. Um, and I uh, would like to ask a question from the audience. From um, uh, Shilpi Banerjee is asking, a few panelists have highlighted the need for personalized intervention or matching the patient to the intervention. To be currently know enough to do this meaningfully, how does one go about matching intervention and uh, patient? Uh, and I think this sort of came up earlier uh, in um, at the beginning of the panel, but if you could um, speak to that, right? Dr. Anderson? Yeah, we're actually doing studies now on depression, not the audiology, where we have a set of modules and we let patients decide what to work with. And to our surprise, it works just as good as we, if we tailor it to them. I think when you talk about personalized medicine, we have these dreams of uh, machine learning and algorithms that would prescribe, the, but patient choice and preference makes a difference, you know. If you have a description, would you like to work with this? And it's, you know, that's the part of it that's really, really important. And we, we, But you need to do the studies, but it could, some people, when I tell them about this, they say, oh, don't they avoid the hard work then and just take the easy way out? No, they don't, you know, they want to be helped. And sometimes they already tested something, tried something, but they want to test something different. The personalization is really, really important down to the methods you use, right, actually. Uh, so that's, uh, but also as a psychologist, I need to say that there are differences between people and ages. Older people can be very stressed. If you ask them, you can choose what hearing aid you like. I remember that from back in my old, early training when I saw this. And how could this old person know? They had no clue what the hearing aid is the best, you know. So it's, so it needs to be the delicate balance between informed decisions, if you know what you may choose between, and then forcing people to choose be something they don't have a clue, you know, so it's not so easy. But at least I think personalization is very important to, to consider in rehab or in most things, I think, yeah. And just to kind of jump in there, um, I, I think another thing is to, to make sure that your content is appropriate for your target. So having patients or uh, end users involved in the co-creation of your of your materials can be really, really powerful because you're, you're then using their language. Um, you're actually removing any barriers to implementation and to uptake that could occur just simply by you creating something that might not be a completely aligned to need. Um, so we use something um, at the moment in a, in a current project that I'm leading on called the person-based approach to um, digital intervention development. So this comes out of uh, Lucy Yardley's lab in Southampton. Um, and it's very much about having the, the end user involved in every single button, click and press, every word that you're going to use uh, to make sure that you remove every potential barrier for use so that you're not creating an intervention to help use hearing aids that has its own barriers to use. So um, just making sure that um, patients are, are kind of embedded in the in, in the development of online rehab, I think that's really important too. And, uh, should we, oh, go ahead. Uh, yeah, for for uh, individual personalized rehabilitation, I think there's a lot of many issues there. Just because precision uh, rehabilitation or in development rehabilitation is slightly different from what we call the precision medicine because a lot of precision medicine is based on genetic base. Really, you can test the gene, you know which one is the works. But for rehabilitation, is so many different factors here, including such as the age, 
all kinds of the how they are doing and the work they're interested. For example, for ordinary person, you can have different material, and some people like music, or some people like a different stuff. And the whole thing is really is different, uh, such as uh, really different uh, method compared to the other way. But it's a tough one, but the important one. We really need to figure out a way how to provide individual adaptations. That's why a lot of studies show it's some mixed you know, because we cannot just okay, I give one program, you change it, see how it might improve. We'll see. Some people can, uh, improve a lot. Some people have no improvement. Some people that can also some people is forced to change. Sometimes didn't help at all. And we do think. So what way we can find it? One way is we can maybe you can use it called uh, such as uh, big data or we call the AI. Really, we can combine all the data together. Can we find a way, such as we have ten different applications, and uh, each person have different such as equivalent, age, all kinds? Of, can we pull all this information and guidance us? Can all we can direct some kind of individual such as application uh, help? Maybe that's the future. We really need to combine all the information together to see what is best for individual. Right. And uh, um, Shilpi actually asked a follow-up question uh, for Dr. Anderson, whether patients' choices are the same ones as clinicians, when patients can choose which one they took, is uh, how close it, it aligns with what clinicians I don't know if you had that as a condition in your study. Uh, well, yeah, we, we definitely could check, you know, but, but what, what we don't know is the previous, and this is on depression or tinnitus, we don't know about patients' previous experience. And I, referring to Nancy's uh, comment on the, in neuropsychological rehabilitation, you talk about error-free learning. You don't learn from failure, you learn from success. So if you have failed with something before, it might be better to test something different. So I don't have a control of that that aspect, but I do think it's you know, in, uh, it was mentioned as well with patient engagement and patient involvement. I there's not so much evidence that this makes, but it certainly makes common sense. You know, reach the end users, at least check with them if this is uh, fit for them, and but bearing in mind that sometimes they don't know, because they. How could they? You know, they, they're not researchers. They haven't invented this. But, you know, so co-work, yes, but some, I'm sorry for jumping on toes now, but sometimes it's more for shows that it sounds good to have a patient representative, but you're really not listening. So if you can combine it in a good, decent way, it's all thumbs up. But it's hard. It's a challenge to find those patients who are able, and perhaps the ones who can be sort of expressive enough to to uh, have the courage to, to to help you improve your interventions you know so that's a comment on that from experience yeah yeah i think Thank that's you. really interesting and that's kind of um how we started out with with ppi so patient and public involvement and it when you have a patient and public involvement member there can be a tension between what you know as a researcher and what they know as a patient and and kind of how that dynamic works is quite interesting what I'm talking about with co-production is actually slightly different. It's more about shared ownership. So actually they become a researcher, they become part of the research team and, and help co-produce something. But that doesn't mean that the intervention you're developing isn't theory guided. So it has to be within the bounds of theory. So you will have a theory that's, that's guiding your intervention development, but their voice comes through so that whatever, the way that you write it, it is very aligned to their understanding. I think that's kind of a slight difference and probably the way the field is moving now. Right. And uh, with that, I believe we're at the end of our panel. I would like to thank the panelists for a very insightful discussion. And obviously we could have continued for much longer. Um, there were a couple of questions that unfortunately we didn't have time to get to. Um, and some of them were asking about specific um, software uh, from Dr. Taimuri and Dr. Fu, and I would encourage people who are interested to perhaps so you can mention the websites um, that people can go on and learn more about um, MT5 or um, uh, Tiger Speech, I guess would be for Dr. Fu. Um, 
and uh, we can put those links in the chat as well. Um, so thanks very much. And uh, we hope um, we had an opportunity to learn and do better in the future with online audiologic rehabilitation. Thanks a lot. Oh, it was a pleasure to be with everybody. Thank you. Yeah, it was great. Thank you, everybody. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. So we will now take a 10 minute break and then half past the hour, we'll have our second panel. Oh, okay, so are we up again now, Valerie? Yes. Okay, great. Well, welcome everybody. Um, you're on the third day of our meeting. Uh, thanks for staying engaged. Um, I know we all know it's not all that easy, but um, I think this next panel is going to definitely keep you engaged. Um, we have our industry discussion panel. Uh, now, we've heard a lot about ways that clinical care had to change. Um, to adapting to practicing during COVID. And what we're going to hear from now is how the major players in the hearing aid industry have to adapt their plans to facilitate uh, remote care. And so what we have today are five representatives from the five big hearing aid manufacturers. And in alphabetical order, we have Laurel Christensen from Resound, Dave Fabry from Starkey, Stefan Lorna from Sonova, Sir Nilsson from Widex in the US and Hasmita Ratanji Ben Mali uh, from who works at Audicle Global, but she's representing Otcon. Uh, in a minute, I'm going to ask each of them to briefly introduce themselves and then give a three-minute whirlwind description of how their company addressed the need for remote care during COVID. Um, after each has presented, we're going to have a discussion. So as you've been doing up till now, put your questions in the chat box. Now, I will say I want to keep the discussion broad, so I'll tell you now that I'm going to prioritize questions that address a general issue uh, rather than ones that are um, company or product specific. Um, I'm going to assume that the panelists will be happy to answer those kind of questions, either maybe in Gather Town or by email or some other forum. Uh, but I'd like to keep it so that everybody can join in and potentially answer um, and talk about every question comes up. Um, so um, I'm going to now ask everyone to introduce themselves. And this time I'll go in reverse alphabetical order. Um, actually, no, I'm not. I just randomize the order. Cern, will you introduce just introduce yourself and give us your three minute summary of what Widex did for during COVID? Can you hear me now? Great. Thank you uh, for this and thanks for this opportunity to speak to your audience at this conference today. My name is Sean Nielsen and I'm the president of Widex in the US. I've worked for 16 years in medical devices and the last six in hearing care. And one thing I've learned through this time is that it's never just about product or just about technology. First and foremost, it's about people and then about how technology is being used. And that's how we look at it from at Vitex. So as such, I was intrigued when I got the invite for this conference. And I will start out with a bit of a warning at Vitex. We do have a different approach. Vitex is entirely focused on the independent hearing care professional because we believe that they uh, provide the best possible experience and outcomes for, for people with a hearing loss. 
Uh, and that's actually also why we don't sell Widex technology through big box retailers and, and, and such places. Our belief in the importance of the licensed hearing care professional is, is also reflected in the way we have been offering remote solutions, uh, both prior to and through COVID. Um, we believe that a proper hearing evaluation is, is multifaceted and requires a licensed ATP to be in the same room as the patient at the very initial stage. And there's a couple of reasons for that. I think there's both sort of the physical assessment that uh, uh, there are some intricacies in terms of evaluating, is there airwax, is there a special need because of the, uh, the shape of the air canal when, when a choice of, uh, of dome or air mold is made. But probably more importantly, the psychological assessment and, and the coaching, which is such a critical part of, of successful hearing care treatment. So although our remote care solution offers live FaceTime face interaction, the ACP cannot fully assess the emotional state of the, the patient is what we've found uh, remotely. And, and it's not easy to obtain input from uh, relatives or spouse which, uh, which which is often actually very valuable as you're know, getting to know a patient and, and supporting them with hearing aids. So Wilex, uh, the Wilex remote solution requires the HCP to set up the hearing aid uh, in the beginning. And from then on, there's really full functionality of, uh, of, of our solution, both uh, the hearing aid and, uh, and um, any fitting adjustments that, that they might want to make. Um, and we also offer um, this, uh, the, the in situ measurement so that it's possible to get the sound level right that's even available remotely. Um, <clears throat> but, um, but in addition to that, we've actually thought uh, a little bit further about what does remote care look like. And with Wilex Moment, we launched the third generation artificial intelligence technology which allows users to optimize the sound and enjoy the moment uh, with the uh, use of powerful artificial intelligence. And, and it means that whether the patient is dining in or dining out, they can really help themselves, uh, even when the HCP cannot be there or just takes a well-deserved break. So we do th see this as another important part of what remote care is looking, starting to look like and will look like in the future. Thank you. And in, in essence, for us, the ultimate purpose is to make patients able to participate actively in life. And, and that's not just about products, it's about transforming people's lives where the expert and the personal touch that the HCP offers is critical. And we think that's where the journey should start. Um, we are uh, offering the, the remote solution and we see the ideal solution here as a hybrid, uh, hybrid approach where follow-up uh, consultations very often can be done successfully with, uh, with patients um, and, uh, and the combination of both really gives the, the best outcomes the way we see it. Okay, thank you, Saren. Um, Laurel, introduce yourself and... Uh... Not hearing you. Um, and I, I've been in this position for um, almost the last 20 years, 19 years at this point. I think, um, you know, when we when we look at um, our current environment and, and the environment that occurred as we entered COVID last March, you know, I, th I think we uh, in manufacturing had to really think really quickly about how we were going to handle the situations. Um, from from our perspective at Resound, um, we already had Resound Assist on the market, which was an asynchronous solution. People could access um, support through their HCP um, by going into the app and, and asking for help. There's a series of questions, and and then that would go to the HCP, and and they could you know modify you know anything really about the hearing aid and send it back to the phone, and and things could be uploaded at that time. Um, so through through Resound Assist, um, that asynchronous solution, we already had that, but at the time of COVID. Then we're, you know, we need to rethink at, at this point. Um, we need to figure out a different way um, to operate because, um, you know, we have patients now, existing patients and, you know, patients that are new, they, they have masks on. 
They, you know, this is very difficult and, and, you know, we wanted to be able to support our customers in the best way possible to continue to see their existing patients and to see new patients that they are having issues. And, and so right around that time, we, we were in a lucky position where we launched kind of a full resound assist live, which is a, a synchronous solution where, you know, video conferencing, you know, back and forth, full, uh, full access to fitting in the hearing aids you know, in, in that kind of setting. And I think, you know, most manufacturers have that today. And I think, you know, what we've had to really learn, I think in, in our, um, you know, in our business, we've really had to learn that, you know, we, we do, um, you know, we provide hearing aids to people who are, are elderly, you know, they are not as tech savvy. And so there's been a lot of learnings on the part of companies like ours. Um, we've, we've had to really come up with very clear instructions on, on how, you know, how we're going to use the technology, you know, written instructions. We've had, um, sessions with the office staff, um, at HCP's offices so that they can do practice sessions. They can help download all the apps that are needed. Um, we've created very clear videos on, on how to change your batteries, how to charge your hearing aid, how to insert your hearing aids, everything that you can do at a distance, because we've really, um, you know, we've been forced to go at, at a distance um, and, and to really have access to technical support. And, uh, you know, I really think that, you know, the, the situation and the environment that we're in just accelerated teleaudiology in, in our industry um, for hearing aid fitting and for many other things. Um, but, uh, you know, you look at it for hearing aid fitting and, and this is a very good thing. We, you know, we have patients, we serve a population that often cannot get, um, you know, to, to the practitioner. I, I actually have my 85 year old mother who lives in our home and it is very hard to get her to a practitioner and to be able to do all of these things remotely, you know, I think is the future. And I think it is convenient for, for our patients. And I think that's where, you know, a company like ours is headed. The technology is there. And, and, you know, in COVID, we did it to support our customers and, and to keep everybody in business and to support the needs of that end user. Um, but in the end, I think, you know, we're, we're on a journey where more and more and more will go, um, you know, will go on in a telehealth kind of environment. Thank you. Thank you. Dave. Okay. Can you hear me? Yep. All right, so this has been a very personal journey for me uh, as well as uh, I, I like to say that telehealth has been a solution that's been hiding in plain sight for about 25 years. I did first remote programming of hearing aids back in 1993 when I was still at Mayo Clinic. Um, and yet we didn't see widespread adoption that occurred in the ensuing years. Starkey had T2 on demand that used DTMF tones uh, beginning uh, over a decade ago. But then uh, it was really reserved for use, telehealth was, by early adopters and innovators uh, until COVID hit. And then uh, everyone wanted to use it, as both Soren and, and Laurel said. Uh, and our philosophy as well was that we think that the initial uh, experience and acknowledgement and agreement to participate in telehealth needs to be take, take place face to face. And so the immediate need during COVID was we had to quickly adapt our asynchronous hearing care anywhere telehealth solution so that it could be enabled remotely. Previously, we had required that the patient and the provider uh, set it up and agreed to uh, uh, with all of the appropriate uh, uh, confidentiality agreements and things face to face. And so we had to adapt that very quickly. And then we also launched a synchronous solution during COVID that allowed for audio and visual to do some of the things that Laurel mentioned, counseling and support in addition to the reprogramming. And both asynchronous and synchronous solutions, I believe, uh, have a role and we offer and offer to this day both synchronous and asynchronous solutions. One of the interesting things that we've seen is that during the pandemic, as we launched the synchronous solution, uh, live sessions we call it, uh, they increased asynchronous decline, but did not go to zero. So that's where we think moving forward and be interested in the discussion portion of this to see if there is a role for both moving forward. Like Soren, we also believe that empowering the patient to be able to make fine tuning adjustments in their real world environment is important, but also another way uh, that we feel it's important to bring to the telehealth solution is a self-check feature. 
that allows the patient to use a diagnostic to quickly ascertain whether the microphone circuit or receiver is in need of maintenance prior to setting up valuable chair time for the practitioner. They can do that at any time and as many times as they wish, and the data can then be interpreted by the professional prior to setting up a face-to-face -face or remote care session. And then finally, the other way that we pivoted really between uh, uh, our, our system of face-to-face -face care uh, was to engage and involve the family member and the professional caregiver through an app that we call Thrive Care that allows uh, provide uh, patients uh, to share data uh, that is in terms of their physical activity, social engagement with professional caregivers or family members so that they can monitor in real time and serve as a coach to enable them on their hearing journey. So we really see that telehealth needs to be part of a solution moving forward and should be part of best practice. Thank you. Hasmita. Thanks, Gabby. Hi, my name is Hasmita, and tonight I will uh, uh, represent Oticon. I'm an audiologist background and uh, just recently completed uh, my PhD in a, in a hybrid model. Um, so how did Oticon uh, respond to the pandemic? Um, as everyone on the panel has mentioned that, uh, you know, these telehealth uh, tools or these uh, remote care apps have been available for, you know, a period of time. What the pandemic or COVID-19 has done, it has actually just accelerated the uptake. Um, and it's actually pushed us as clinicians to, to open our eyes and, and, you know, respond to what our patients Patients were needing out there. So, you know, in the in the beginning of the pandemic, many countries around the globe went into quite a hard lockdown, where even audiology clinics were uh, completely closed or only, uh, you know, open for emergency cases. So, in that instance, it, it really um, facilitated the uptake of Oticon's remote care uh, application, which is a synchronous uh, fine tuning ass uh, assistant app. Um, as you know, we went further into 2020, it, we could see the uplifting of, of the uh, restrictions. O audiology in many countries also became, uh, de was deemed a, an essential service. Um, so then we could see this, you know, practices started opening up, but of course needed to uh, um, uh, ensure that they adhere to the, uh, the, the regulations. Um, and in that time, you know, we saw different types of, of usage of the apps and, and this real need for face-to-face -face care in combination with online care. And this is where, you know, this hybrid model really, really started uh, taking uh, shape. And we could see that, you know, providers or audiologists out there started becoming extremely creative in how could they ensure that they could bring down the risk factor in, in seeing patients face-to-face -face because, you know, we believe and we're committed to uh, our professionals out there. So how do how do how does Oricon ensure that the professionals out there have the tools to ensure that the face to face care would you know uh, continue as as planned, but then support this patient in an online uh, uh, modality when that made sense. So we saw the shift of how practice uh, was unfolding. We saw some people being you know, more creative, for an example, they set up two rooms. One was actually where the patient was sitting with the remote care application and the clinician in the other room uh, for, for patients who were extremely uh, uh, afraid and who were, you know, uh, higher up on that risk factor list. So we could see different ways of using it. And, and I think this is in, it's an extremely interesting time in our profession because it's it's allowing us to open our eyes and, and look at the opportunity and, and not just accept status quo. And uh, a lot of this is, is really going to come from what does the patient need? How do we ensure we're uh, uh, practicing person-centered care? And it's not a one size fits all. Um, so telehealth is a tool in our toolbox, but it's really about how do we bring them together and ensure that the patient sitting in front of us, this is the right tools for them to ensure that we get the best service or delivered to them. Um, so there, there were many things that, you know, and together with the, the remote care app that was brought out, there was also this GSI and test flex that was released um, in the same time. So there, there are the tools, but it's really about, you know, me as a hearing care provider, what is my uh, delivery model? You know, who am I seeing? What is my patient group, uh, et cetera, et cetera. And then trying to figure out uh, what makes most sense for the patient in front of me. Thank you. Steph. 
Uh, thank you. Yeah, I mean, um, we had very similar experiences as uh, the people uh, talking before me. My, uh, my name is uh, Stefan Launer and I'm in charge of audiology and health innovation for uh, Sonova, which includes uh, the brands of Funag Unitron and also uh, quite a bit of retail through the audiological care network. Um, so uh, for me, it was also very interesting to observe how COVID really pushed the application, the adoption, and also to some extent, at least the acceptance of uh, tele um, solutions forward. Um, we had been working on this topic uh, for years, but uh, oftentimes people were very reluctant to use it because um, they thought also to some extent it was a threat, which in my view, it is not at all, but it's something maybe um, to discuss forward. And then all of a sudden when COVID hit us and the shops were closed, audiologists and also uh, uh, hearing impaired people started to adopt and accept these um, remote solutions. And for me, it was extremely interesting to observe how we also had to learn to um, provide the services in a different way, how powerful these ways um, can be, but also that it's not just a simple, oh, here is the remote support tool. You have to educate, you have to train people, you have to give guidelines how to use them. You also have to psychologically support them and encourage them to use it. That's a very important part as well. And uh, as an organization, we have built uh, a lot of guidelines to help audiologists and uh, users to get through this process. We have uh, set up a full documentation called the bridge um, that should help audiologists to get through this process, to learn how to use it, to be encouraged to use uh, remote support tools. And in some countries, at least, we were not um, allowed to do any face-to-face -face, um, fittings anymore, especially in the early phases of COVID. So we had to develop models that were no touch at all. So full digital um, uh, processes still with uh, audiologists uh, involved and uh, we need to have some reliable online screening tools. We needed to develop tools or approaches to think about ear health and uh, all these related topics. But it showed that these models are um, possible and uh, we can use and build on them in the future to provide hearing care services in regions where we don't have a strong audiological infrastructure or for people who are not uh, mobile. So we, we can really use these services. It has shown the power of these services. Um, but from my end, it also showed the limitations. What I found extremely interesting was to observe once in certain countries shops opened again, um, we were surprised to see how quickly and how many people would go back to see their audiologists. So it also shows the importance of the personal interaction in the hearing instrument fitting, um, the professional guidance and the professional support in this uh, entire process. So from my perspective, one of the major learnings is that in the future, a hybrid model where we have um, good tools which are easy to use, um, a good usability, good reliability, and a good healthcare professional involved. And they combine a personal meeting combined with um, uh, online support is probably an extremely um, powerful way to go. We also learned a lot of positive things uh, because we learned that in certain settings, it was much easier now to involve family members simply because when the family members were living remote, all of a sudden through a video call, they could join in um, the session instead of having to travel a long distance. So we really saw that family support was uh, was supported through the use of um, uh, remote and virtual um, fitting tools. And we also learned that we could apply much more individual fittings. We We learned that we could apply the fittings in the home environments, in the work environments, do much more specific fittings and much more specific counseling. So I think that is uh, extremely powerful tools to drive innovation um, forward. I think from here we have to develop 
these new innovations um, further. I think we have to also start educating our audiologists potentially earlier in their education um, to involve them, to empower them to use these tools. And I think we have to fill the gaps so that we can really assure a good high quality audiological services, even in models where they have to be um, fully online for whatever reason. Um, so uh, I think uh, it's a pretty interesting and amazing um, point in time where we are at. And uh, I look forward to yeah, uh, new models of really great service delivery in the future. Yeah, thank you. Well, it's interesting because all of you addressed various questions I had in, in different ways. Um, I know a couple of you talked about what, what did you learn during COVID? And I know Steph addressed that and Laurel addressed that. And I think Cosmita talked about a, a hybrid model. Uh, did Dave and Saren want to add anything? I don't think you necessarily specifically addressed what, what you felt like you learned. Well, for us, that that we uh, I mentioned that we had previously required that the audiologist and the patient uh, engage face to face prior to initializing uh, our telehealth feature uh, here in Care Anywhere, and that we had to quickly adapt that to enable that to be done remotely. And then we also uh, accelerated the development of our synchronous model because we felt as though people uh, appreciated the convenience of asynchronous telehealth. The store and forward approach that allows the patient to initiate a request for fine tuning anywhere they are having trouble, but it takes away from that ability to engage with audio video visual and to do, enable the counseling and, and question uh, uh, aspect of that is uh, the engagement that's possible face to face. Um, and so we accelerated that development during COVID uh, and launched it only a few months in. So those were the two primary lessons. So what did, what did you guys learn? So, so in one realization for us was there was of course a pickup where the journey because it became very remote and that was very little interaction, direct interaction, as as uh, uh, I think Kusmita also described in the very beginning when clinics actually had to shut down. And I think we found that um, as soon as they were able to open up the face-to-face -face journey actually came back into play and that's part of the reason why when i said well, our learning is that that uh, a hybrid model where there is both a face-to-face -face component and the ability to follow up and support uh, and, and we we very much focused on this the synchronous support uh, from the acp to patients and wide um, that uh, that is the combination of the two that's uh, that has the, the power as we see it it seems like that's where everybody's kind of going with that with their conclusion. Does anybody else want to address Dave's comment about synchronous versus asynchronous? Because it's funny because I had assumed that synchronous was the way to go. And then I heard I know that lively think it's very important that you do asynchronous as well. Um does anybody else want to comment um on that? I think See, from my perspective, sorry. Um yeah, go ahead, uh Steph, and then Lorna. From my perspective, um, there is a place for both. And for me, it's not either or. Um, I think probably both um, solutions have certain um, advantages. You know, uh, in a synchronous situation, you can also really personally interact uh, in a situation and you can also see a patient and you can provide support. However, due to bandwidth stability and whatever other technical reasons that might not be possible or you have to upload a new setting and the patient may want to try it and then get back to you. So I think um, you should have both solutions in the portfolio uh, ultimately at some point, uh, and there is a space for um, both. Laurel? Yeah, I, I agree, and I think Dave said it well. You know, it, if you're in the environment where you're having trouble, there's no better time to then just create that uh, you know, that communication with the HCP, you know, I'm, I'm at the coffee house. This is what I'm trying to listen to and I can't hear it. Um, so getting that immediate feedback as to what's going on, I think the asynchronous works really well for that. But of course, you know, having that live synchronous solution for counseling and for all the face to face interactions is, is extremely important. You know, I, I would mention one other thing I'm learning. I think I think we as a company learned more than anything that the user centricity of it is incredibly important. 
you know, it, it, the user design and how that end user can engage with all these technologies and, and you know, just by nature of, of the end users that we serve, this has to be very simple to do. And, and we really learned that there's a, a lot of things you've got to do up front um, and we, we utilize kind of the front office staff and really training them on how to get patients ready for um, that telehealth visit with the audiologist um, and making sure that they had a number, a telephone number to call if they had trouble. I think that was the biggest learning we had is really getting the end user ready to do these um, teleaudiology sessions. And I think that's something that you know, how we design it and making it as simple as, as we possibly can moving forward, I think are things that we have to continue to work on. Yeah, but can I comment on this maybe? Sure. Because I found it extremely interesting, you know, this is absolutely the case, but I found it also extremely interesting to note how um, some people sometimes surprise you, you know, we say the elderly and they are not that tech savvy. We had also people aged 80 and 90 plus and they came back and did it and they did it with their daughter but they explained it to their daughter how to do it not the other way around so it's also really surprising how the individuals react to it and how it's individually extremely difficult um, to decide whether a person is capable or not i think we have to encourage them we have to guide them and we have to support them but we shouldn't underestimate um what also elderly people are willing and capable to do. So, uh, so I think the one learning we also had, age is not a good criterion. It's one, but it's not a reliable one. We had really elderly people who did it perfectly well. Yeah, and it would seem like motivation on the part of the user is really key. It's just simply that question, do you want to do this? Yeah. yeah. Rather than me trying to predict whether you want to do it. Asmita, what were you gonna add? Sure, just on the synchronous and asynchronous, I think, you know, if we look at the entire patient journey, there's opportunity for both asynchronous and synchronous and depending on where the patient is and how we want to assist them, there's value in that. And, and I'm, I'm talking with reference to uh, the studies I've just completed because I followed those patients right through from the time they were online searching for information or getting in touch. Uh, for uh, advice on hearing to bringing them into the clinic and then moving them back online that it it was what do they need at this point in time and could that uh, you know need if they contacted me asynchronously and I replied in that way you know it would start building that relationship with the rapport and then when it was time or they were ready for in-clinic visit then that was synchronous so it was it was just that you know it 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 like Stefan said, there is no right or wrong, or it's not one or the other. It's us thinking um, about this almost on a clean slate and not just taking the patient journey as we have it today and trying to alter it. Um, that is also one option, but it's almost us starting from, you know, a blank. And then on the point of training, I think our assumptions of patients are, yes, they're not digitally proficient, but then again, in our study, we showed that digital proficiency was not a predictor for an uptake of, you know, online and face-to-face -face care age was. Um, so again, our biases come through uh, quite strong. And then the last one on training is we think we're, you know, so focused on training our patients, but we also need to train our HCPs and bring them along as well. So this mindset shift the insist and, and and I think there's an opportunity here in many clinics where you have a, a um, generation diversity is try to use that to our advantage where we have the younger clinicians to try to assist some of the older clinicians but bring everyone's point of view together I think there there is great potential there thank you thank you okay I'm going to ask the question from uh, the audience um, Dave have you got a, you got a real quick thing Real quick, I'll make it real quick. Uh, one very other, uh, another important issue as it relates to synchronous, asynchronous is synchronous in many places is the only way to bill and receive payment for. However, asynchronous has an important way to improve clinical efficiencies because the adjustments may be made by the professional outside of traditional chair time in between patients in the evenings. And that's an important economic and efficiency that is created by having both solutions. Yeah, I think that's a very good point. Okay, so this is, I'm going to read this from uh, one, of, one of the audience. It says, 
We know in audiology, self-fitting is the future of care. So the emphasis will be in creating personalized solutions within app tools or personalized rehab programs. Can the panel speak on how the future of self-fitting hearing aids, on the future of self-fitting hearing aids, what resources to promote individual rehab that the audiologist can provide? So I think what they're asking is, is that balance that, that the, what can the audiologist provide for the if you agree with the self-fitting being the future of audiology. Dave. Yeah, I'll take issue with I don't believe that self-fitting is the way of the future for the majority of patients for let's say at least the next five to ten years. Uh, because I believe that more of a DTC model rather than an OTC model is the one that the hybrid model where an individual may look for another pathway to procure, uh, obtain hearing aids, but many will still want access to the professional to assist them with that. And that's why I believe that telehealth, an assisted fitting and process, is probably the more near-term uh, solution that will be successful because we believe technology in the hands of the professional, knowing the patient's needs, is the best way. It produces the best outcomes. But we do also agree that uh, involving patient-centered or patient-driven design is important. And so we have tools, online tools or, or app-related tools like Hear Coach, an oral rehabilitative tool that's available, uh, as well as uh, in the last session where they were discussing tinnitus as a means of uh, the patient uh, undergoing a rehabilitation program with the assistance and monitoring, if you will, of the professional. And that fits into our overall vision where we see it more than self-fitting, we see a uh, professional guided, professional assisted with more and more patient engaged or patient driven approaches as the inevitable solution, I think, as the question said. I see, I see lots of nodding. So yeah, and I will add to that. So, so I completely agree with Dave that I don't see the future is self-fitting for the majority of patients. There might be some that that uh, find that sort of uh, meeting their needs, but not not the majority as we see it. And uh, and one of the things we can do is of course to make sure that that sort of situational information is is transferred effectively to the hearing care professionals, so they can take that into account. It can be hard to find out exactly what has been the issue and under which circumstances it occur if you are trying to troubleshoot or help a patient as a, as a hearing care professional. And it, I mean, it's some of the things we do, and I, I think others as well, in we are actually providing the information from our uh, artificial intelligence and the adjustments that the user has been doing in the moment to the hearing care professional. It's available through their fitting software. So I think that it becomes this combination where I'm a strong believer in the engagement of patients in the care, and I think it's a way to achieve better outcomes in itself when uh, when patients are engaged. But I also think it's important that we, we use the technology to then sort of transfer that information and give us as accurate a sort of uh, a picture to the hearing care professionals, because it's going to be continuing to be a collaboration between the patient and the hearing care professional to, to, uh, to achieve the best outcomes. Steph, you put your hand up. Thank you. Yeah, I also wanted to say, you know, uh, from my perspective, I think it's too simplistic to just say, is it self-fitting? Um, because there are many different variants of how we could do um, self-fitting. I mean, is it self-fitting with the patient being entirely alone, buying the device someplace and then fitting it all, all alone? Or is it a hybrid model where they get some um, really good support? I'm a firm believer that we should engage and empower the patients to to or the the, the uh, customers um to do also more themselves to um, adapt to their individual needs and we should provide them with tools but from my end i think uh, audiologists supporting them interacting them taking the data of um, the self-fitting into a professional fitting software and building on it and integrating it in a, in a workflow. So a much more collaborative approach to fitting um, is the way to go. And um, I was intrigued by some work that uh, Brent Edwards published from Nell, where they did lots of analysis on who are candidates for um, self-fitting and who are not. And, and from uh, how I read his data, maximally, um, a quarter of all um, hearing impaired people seem to be 
encouraged and willing to do a full self-fitting approach. Three quarters actually prefer an approach where they get some support either from a uh, tech savvy um, family member or a colleague and almost half really preferred clearly to have a healthcare professional uh, involved. And I think these data also speak to themselves. I, I think hearing, hearing health is a, is a serious matter and people really benefit from professional support in the process. Laurel, you were nodding. Did you want to add anything? Yeah, you know, I, I think, um, I think, you know, we're, we're in an industry where we don't serve as many people as we need to. Um, so I think having things like self-fitting hearing aids are great. If it's going to bring more people in to get better hearing, I'm all for it. Um, but like the panel, I believe, you know, a hybrid approach where a professional is involved is is probably the best way forward for most people. And I think that's that is what we're seeing in research that most people want, you know, someone involved in the fitting. Um, but it, but I do think you know we have to be open to whatever brings more people to get hearing healthcare. Um, because I don't think we have, uh, you know, we're not bringing it to enough people. So I'm glad there will be models that are direct to consumer and self fitting and in all kinds of different ways. I think that that self fitting and direct to consumer are going to be much more limited to people who have less hearing loss. And I think as the hearing loss gets greater, the need to be seen face to face and 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 have good counseling and good fitting with the hearing health care professional becomes more and more important. And I think, you know, those are where the differentiators will really come into play. Yeah. Uh, did you want to add anything? No, I think I, I agree with the panel and that there is a space for all of us and it, it will also push the boundaries and uh, force clinicians to to differentiate and, and provide evidence based practice and, and you know, com do complete assessments, etc. So I think it, it, it forces everyone to to reflect on on the type of service delivery that they're offering. Yes. Okay, now this is a question again from the audience. I think it's a good question. I don't know if you'll actually be able to answer it in this forum. It says, is there any possibility of all brands combining forces and creating a joint telehealth platform for hearing care professionals and audiologists and their clients? <laughs> I, I can add uh, from our perspective, and I've been very involved with the, the R&D side of things as well, um, that uh, I understand the request. It would be nice, right? It would create, make it simple. Um, I do think that the technologies are fundamentally different in some important ways, and, and so is the way we fit hearing aids. Wiredex has a completely different uh, technology, and it requires different things and considerations made by the, the HCP. So while nothing is impossible, it would be a big, big feat to, uh, to be able to create one, one interface from a, uh, from a fitting uh, point of view when it comes to, to remote care. <clears throat> Anybody else got any comments? Okay, uh, Laura. Yeah, you know, I would just say that, you know, we all do, you know, fit our hearing aids differently, but we all use a system called NOAA today to, to do that. Um, so we, you know, there, there is a platform available to do something like that. I mean, clearly you'd ultimately need to be in your own company software and your own company apps and things, but you could see some of this could be integrated in a NOAA system. Um, I'm not so sure we're really talking about doing that today. I don't think that's um, one of the priorities right now for him. So, but, uh, but I could see that there is a system, you know, in place to, to do it. You know, I think the things that have to be thought about though is the personalization of having an app. Um, it, you know, it's, it's just so easy to, to go into these apps and, and make a lot of, you know, personalization, which is clearly the future in these kinds of, you know, hearing aids and hearing healthcare. And, and those are the areas where it'd be a little bit harder to, you know, make it all alike because it's not just on the fitting software side where the ACP is, it's, it's on the app side um, where, where the end user is as well. So it becomes a little bit harder to R&D, but, but we are on a, you know, one platform. There are pieces of it that I think you could probably make the same. Okay, so you put your hand up. I was I was just going to uh, say what uh, HIMSA has had discussions about serving as a standard platform for the telehealth feature uh, from the audiologists from the provider side. There would be some utility to that because you can imagine dashboards to keep track of patients that uh, were visible in a shared platform because 
many practitioners work with multiple manufacturers and to be able to follow those patients, it would be convenient. And I think maybe that was the origin of the question is that if I, if I fitted one of each of the manufacturers represented here uh, and having those on a, on a dashboard, uh, that is a, a NOAA type platform would be useful. But then I'd agree with Laurel, I think from the hardware perspective, uh, the, the unifying tool is probably the Android phone or the, or the iPhone that serves as the vehicle for that's really all the hardware that's required. It used to take a village. Now it really just takes a <laughs> smartphone on the end of the patient and the convenience that each of us have from the patient side to be able to never leave the app that they're using to control the device to initiate a request with them, I think is probably the way forward. But I do believe that there is room on the practitioner side, given that most work with multiple manufacturers to easily check in via a dashboard, a unifying dashboard would be a useful tool. Yeah. Well, from my end, you know, um, I think there's probably op uh, opportunities to streamline and harmonize. Um, and this is a discussion we might have to intensify and also better understand what are the needs of the customers um, and the HCPs to really um, for, for harmonization and the standard platform. I think it also has to be appreciated that all our products have different features, different functionalities, different philosophies. And that basically also requires then different ways of interactions and different tools and also different fitting tools. So, so um, as also has been said before, there is quite a bit of um, potential in harmonizing, but there is also clear limitations because our products are different um, in their functionality. But it's a pop topic that uh, we, again, I guess, should also take home from here and, uh, and discuss and, and trigger the discussion on the uh, HIMSA level. Yeah, because it certainly makes sense from the practitioner's point of view. Yeah. So, uh, so yeah. Okay, so now another, this is another topic when it comes to telemedicine, a few comments about this is about really measures. What do we do? Should we be striving for sort of technological solutions to do remote re really measures? Is that gonna come about? Does it matter? Who wants to address something along those lines? Well, yeah. Go, Dave. You can go first if you've got your mic on. Um, I'll, I'll defer if you want. You're on now. Okay. <laughs> All right. So uh, we had a we had a uh, a device over a decade ago that uh, had an integrated probe microphone um, that uh, had a snap on. It was like a mic cover that then allowed a probe mic to be placed into the ear canal. And this was done by the professional at the time, but it could easily be adapted to the patient environment. The interesting thing was very few used it. And I think it was in part because those people who believed in uh, using real ear measurements already had a dedicated piece of equipment that they relied on regardless of which manufacturer they were working on. Familiarity breeds content and they were comfortable using that equipment to verify. Those who didn't feel that real ear measurements were an integral part, did, weren't compelled to use it. And so ultimately, because we can't keep investing in technologies that aren't used, um, we stopped manufacturing it. I think uh, the idea is appealing to reconsider in this environment, whether an integrated tool like that for patients to do a probe microphone measurement remotely or independently. But I think more likely, where we'll see the innovation is with an inward facing microphone built into the hearing instrument that rather than requiring something be snapped on and then removed, it would be integrated into the device and may have other functionalities. That's where I see the progress moving forward. I think it's a great idea and discussion point, but that's where I see it going rather than truly probe microphone. Okay. Yeah, basically I wanted to have, um, make a very similar comment. First of all, I think we have to think about for, again, what type of application and for what uh, target group, and we might have different solutions. We could also see examples where a person doesn't do the, the uh, RECD measurements um, themselves, but they have a technical support by uh, a moderately trained technician. There are models where um, audiologists do that remotely with a technician helping them. 
or as uh, Dave also um, pointed out, are there other technical solutions um, and approaches to get to a uh, to get to solve the problem in a different way? You know, like uh, in, inward um, facing microphones, other acoustic measures through the hearing instrument itself. So we may not do this measure, but replace it with another measurement to assure the quality of, of um, the fitting. So I think this is an intensive topic of um, research for the entire industry because for us it's very important that we assure the audiological quality of these new approaches of delivering services and we have to come up with uh, innovative um, solutions also for this audiological quality control as I would call it. Yeah, for me it's maybe an example that uh, so we have the in-situ measurement in the sensorgram, uh, and we generally find that it is a the best way to ensure the, the best possible fit with our hearing aids. There's a lot of sort of uncontrollable factors that people are doing remote uh, fittings, right? The background noise and so on, and and therefore I think that the development is actually more back to some of the things the panel has discussed before in getting used to uh, and, and working with the remote solutions, uh, both the patient and the, the HCP. Uh, I'm not saying this couldn't be a technical step sort of at a, at a much much later uh, stage, but it's not uh, what we see as a as sort of the first and, and most critical one at this point. Anybody else? I was going to say it would be good to have some of the diagnostic people in in a group and, and ask them that question. Uh, but I agree with the panel, you know, there's, uh, we're, we're in this uh, time of innovation. So, uh, again, maybe it will look totally different than what we have today on offer. Yeah. Okay, now somebody has a question that says, how much thought has been put into um, online communication solutions that enable captioning? So for people with a very severe hearing loss, hearing loss who might be having to engage in early care, um, ha have, have you considered that and what's the role of that? Seth? Yeah, we, had, uh, we have considered it. We actually already provided solutions, um, not specifically for the remote fitting, but uh, for the telephone communication uh, use case. We actually had an app which offered um, transcription with uh, pretty uh, pretty good performance but i i have to say maybe it was a little bit too early uptake of this uh, wasn't as good as uh, as had been hoped um so this is really something that is technically um possible and that was offered but um the uptake and the usage by the uh, hcps and the, the clients wasn't as strong as it was expected and uh, and that's interesting, you know, like with all these digital solutions, um, people often think about it, suggest it and th say it would be cool. But then when you offer it, um, uh, the uptake in the market is actually not as fast uh, as you would like it. So I think we also have to mature and use the all these digital tools more. Uh, and that's maybe also education and training. Well, I was going to say, or it could be that it it's not surprising it's not broadly uptaken because it's really key for those people with a particularly severe hearing loss who are a smaller population maybe but they really really need it one could argue but even they did not really um use it despite yeah, being yeah. offered you know it was really like hmm interesting dave um soren mentioned earlier uh, ai and and the possibilities and in the in innovations that are taking place with real-time captioning of speech is phenomenal. Uh, just over the past few years at CES, there have been a variety of companies that have uh, shown that they could successfully in real time uh, do uh, uh, transcription and captioning. And some of the, I think we've learned in the past year, the innovations that have taken place, some of the platforms, Teams, uh, and I have no vested interest in Teams, but we use Teams internally in our group a lot. And they have a real-time captioning feature and a beta version of it that is remarkably good. And, and I would also push back a little bit on the idea that this is for a narrow population. I think for people who are learning a new language uh, and also people who just 
can, if, if there is the opportunity to put the captioning in a spot that doesn't interfere with the visual broadcast. My wife uses captioning all the time on TV and she has normal hearing. And uh, and it, it's I think it's really uh, dependent on your personality, dependent on what your needs are. But but it's interesting to me in that our, our captioning is on all the time at home and it helps a little bit with my presbycusis too. But but the AI aspect of this uh, and the the advances in real time captioning without the need for someone typing out the words has been incredible in just the past few years. That's true. Well, talking okay. So then, I, as we're getting towards the end, um, and you just brought out AI and such like. So my last question is, um, what does the future hold for Pali medicine? Like what we've talked about so far was all stuff that was done as a result of COVID, and we had to rush along. But you know, given time and imagination and all the rest of it, what what exciting things do you think we can expect down the line? Anybody want to? I don't know if it's my video stopped or you all stopped. <laughs> Go ahead, Lauren. Oh. You know, I was just gonna say I think continuing to develop the tools. I, I think you know we talked about the really measurement side of it. Uh, Dave early on mentioned that there's some diagnostics that that Starkey has. You know, if knowing the difference between when you need to come in for a repair or, you know, why is your hearing aid not working in a certain way? I mean, I think having tools like that that you can use, you know, to know when you actually need to come in to see if you're a hearing healthcare professional because your hearing aid doesn't work or, or those kinds of things. I, I think continuing to develop these kinds of tools, I, th I think we'll see a broad toolbox of, of more telehealth solutions as we go forward. Okay. To, Sorry. to add to that, um, you know, from my perspective, I think uh, the development of the tools, and I hope the adoption of the tools and the acceptance of the tools will uh, will improve um, significantly. I would also like to um, suggest that maybe moving forward, we should leverage the, the digital health tools that we have much more broadly. And I would hope that um, hearing instruments moving from um, hearing devices to health agents uh, and talking more about how hearing loss relates to um, broader and other health topics. Um, we potentially could also engage much more, much more broadly with other healthcare professionals and through that really drive the acceptance and the adoption of hearing instruments in a much, much um, broader way and stronger way than what we do today. I mean, digital health, digital therapeutics, <laughs> wearable devices are really um, taking off and growing uh, in, in, in a lot of markets today. And I think this also offers quite a bit of potential um, for us uh, to tap into these solutions um, and uh, to increase the adoptions of our solutions. Thank you. I think uh, if we if we just look at the patient and we think about them in the future, what is it? How do we serve them best? And I and I think it's you know right now we still talk about offering care in a very binary fashion. You know, it's either in the clinic and it's either at home. But I, but I really see this future as it's going to be you know it's it's delivering care to them at the right place at the right time and and then you know the tools become you know just the uh, medium through which they get the care. But it's really about what will life look like, you know, in 10 years from now? And then how does everything blend in, into one another? Um, and then do we have those tools to deliver the care to get them the optimal, uh, you know, care and satisfaction and outcomes and improving their quality of life? So um, I, I still think the future could be beyond just uh, home or in clinic. I think from from my point of view, this, uh, if I divide it into sort of the in practice and then the technology itself, I think in practice, there's definitely an opportunity to integrate it much more and make it part of sort of the standard sort of procedure and way to, to deal with patients, i.e. identifying to which extent the remote solutions would be part of the care for a, a given patient. And, um, and there's even the option, something, a big benefit that we have found through COVID is that it's easier for us to help assist 
audiologists and, and, and specialists with the, uh, with the fitting of a hearing aid because we can just dial in and we can see everything that's going on. We don't have to travel across the state to do that. Uh, and that can even happen within clinics. I think in the future that you might have within a multi-location clinic have a, an expert in tinnitus who gets dialed in and joins if a patient has a special need around that. So I think there's there's a lot in clinic that 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 actually will be advanced over the the years to come as as we've now had this uh, push for for remote uh, because of the pandemic and everything. And then from a technology point of view, I mean we've been using uh, environmental momentary assessment for years in developing our hearing aids, and we've brought sort of the first versions of 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 that to the the hearing care professionals through the artificial intelligence. I think that actually bringing more relevant situational information all the way back to the HCP so that it can be used as part of the fitting is one of the, the big things that we will see more of in, uh, in, uh, in the future. Great. Dave. I'll make it fast. Sorry, I know we're out of time. Um, I think I'd echo uh, that more patient engagement, including tools like the diagnostic that we are already incorporating that enable them to triage whether they need uh, repair or whether they need a visit, an office visit is important and will streamline for the patient and the provider. I think involving family members and professional caregivers, the Thrive Care app is a good example of giving permission to individuals to be able to um, uh, view uh, that health and wellness data. And I completely agree with what Steph said. Uh, health and wellness, the ear is a remarkably good place to measure biometrics and looking at it as a hub for overall health and wellness that can be monitored uh, remotely uh, uh, using telehealth tools and triage to other health conditions, cardiovascular, di uh, co cognitive function, et cetera. Um, and then finally, though, the most important one is, as I think, uh, I don't want to be here in 25 years. Well, who knows where I'll be in 25 years, but I don't want to be talking about whether people are going to incorporate telehealth in 25 years. And I've seen the enemy and the enemy is us in some respects and that we're the barrier that has uh, prevented the uptake and, and telehealth should be more than for a pandemic. Um, and, and what we've seen is already people are starting to go back to their old habits. And we really need to see that people need to recognize there's patient and provider benefits to incorporating telehealth, not as a one or the other solution, but as a hybrid solution. Great, yes, thank you. Well, I think that was very wonderful to hear from you all. I think we had some really good points. Um, it's clear that, well, I, it's, it's surprising to me that, that a few of you have said that people are already going back to old habits that quickly. Um, it is shocking to me considering all of the successes that have been shown along the way. Um, but anyway, thank you all for your valuable time. I guess I'm going to give you your reminder takeaway that people, it would appear based on the questions and comments would love this shared platform. Um, and that it seems that really a management and hearing aid verification is something else that, that the um, attendees are very interested in. Um, anyway, thank you again for your time. Uh, much appreciated. And I don't know if you're going to stay around in Gabba Town or not, but if you are, we possibly want to chat then. Thank you. Thank you, Gabby, for organizing it. It was a great discussion. Thanks, everybody. Good to see you. Thanks, everyone. Thanks for the opportunity. Bye. Bye. Well, uh, so for people who are still um, on this call, we have 77 people still here. Uh, please join us in Gather Town and we can continue the discussion there. All presentations are all to have a place in Gather Town and some of the authors will be there. In Gather Town, if you see the list of attendees, if you want to, uh, you can select one and chat with them directly or you can locate them on the map and you'll have a little line showing you where they are. You can just follow that line and find people there. Okay, and so I hope uh, you enjoyed the discussion. I will see you tomorrow for the last day of this meeting where we'll talk about implementation and some of the hot topics in teleaudiology. Thank you and see you in the other town. Thank you. Thanks for everything. Bye, bye Dave. Bye.